Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our Policy Brief launch uh, via this web webinar. I'm Ed Gabriel, the president of the American Task Force on Lebanon, which is a nonprofit organization that works to strengthen the bilateral ties between the United States and Lebanon. And you know, uh, since October 7th, we've been actively promoting de-escalation and a long-term resolution of tensions along the uh, Lebanon-Israel border. <clears throat> As you probably know, Lebanon today is at the precipice of a devastating war between Israel and Hezbollah. And it's almost going to, almost certainly going to draw in the United States and Iran and others if it happens with catastrophic effects, I believe, on the region. This demands that the United States pay immediate attention and provide the resolve necessary to stop further escalation, in our opinion. Uh, we say to do that, the U.S. needs to do more to avoid Lebanon becoming either a spark to or um, uh, a theater of a regional war. It needs to actively lead in ensuring a durable solution to the current crisis. Such a solution, though, needs to take into account the plethora of challenges facing Lebanon, the most salient of which is Iran's entrenched influence and destabilizing role within Lebanon and the region, especially given the fact that the Lebanese government today is not making decisions of either war or peace. There's also Lebanon's continued governance vacuum for more than a year and a half now, in addition to the country's descent into a quasi-failed state status following its uh, financial collapse. You know, Lebanon's collapse uh, has been called by the World Bank possibly one of the three worst since the mid-19th century. So this policy brief attempts to dissuade parties from pro provocation, as well as providing the need for a more comprehensive roadmap to ensure a lasting stability, not just to ward off a war in the short term, but to ensure that the survival of the Lebanese state occurs in the long term. Now, this latest policy brief, I might say co-authored by uh, a group of 20 leading Lebanon experts and former policymakers from across the political spectrum, proposes a framework of robust diplomacy, which is designed to steer Lebanon away from the precipice of war and to also help it establish a direct and sustainable path to stability and recovery. It also suggests elements of an optimal, multifaceted U.S. policy strategy. So before I turn over to our dear friend and uh, co-creator of these policy briefs, uh, Paul Salem, the former president of MEI, and now the current uh, vice president for international engagement uh, for MEI, um, living in Beirut. Let me just mention that following Paul's remarks, we'll be joined by a panel of experts who will discuss the pressing need to make Lebanon more secure by stabilizing the Lebanese, uh, the Lebanon-Israeli border, addressing Lebanon's leadership vacuum, and reviving its economy. Good to see you, Paul. Over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Gabriel, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. As Ed said, uh, up to a month ago, I was the president as, and CEO of the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., and one of my proudest achievements is building this wonderful partnership with the American Task Force uh, for Lebanon. Uh, using their amazing resources and network uh, around the United States, their frequent visits to Lebanon, as well as the Middle East Institute's research capacity. I think we've put out a very uh, high level and impactful set of policy briefs and tried to uh, impact and improve U.S. policy uh, towards Lebanon. Uh, I am now back in Lebanon. Uh, I spent 11 years in the U.S. and very eager to get back into the region and currently based in Beirut, Lebanon, from where I'm speaking to you today. Uh, I urge everybody to read this policy brief. I want to thank the, uh, particularly the key authors that contributed to the early drafts of it, uh, Nick Nassar, Patricia Karam, and uh, Stephen Howard, 
and all the 20 uh, signatories who made very, very important inputs to shape the policy recommendations. As Ambassador Gabriel laid out, uh, a lot of the uh, recommendations, first of all, acknowledge and track what the US administration, and particularly through Envoy Amos Hochstein, has been busily trying to achieve over the past uh, months, uh, primarily to avoid a major escalation between Israel and Hezbollah, to try to get ahead of the crisis, to figure out the parameters of an eventual ceasefire and new security arrangements, and also to make progress on demarcating the land border between Lebanon and Israel after the successful efforts by Envoy Hochstein to demarcate the maritime borders a couple of years ago. Uh, the uh, policy paper also emphasizes the importance of continuing to uh, make progress towards electing a president uh, for Lebanon and forming an effective government. Uh, it is not a stable position to be in, to be facing the potential of war, to be negotiating with one party in the country without having a fully functioning Lebanese state, uh, able to uh, ratify, able to really provide sustainability for any deal uh, that comes to pass. Uh, it's an excellent policy report. I urge you all to read it. And we have an excellent panel today uh, that uh, I'm eager to listen to. And uh, to get started, I will introduce uh, the moderator for this panel, my friend and colleague, Hiba Nasser, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of the, uh, uh, the Ashart uh, Bureau Chief uh, in Washington. Uh, thank you all for joining us and Hiba. Over to you. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Ambassador and Gabrielle. We will dive deeper into the heart of this policy paper with our dis distinguished panel to understand the current situation on the Israel-Lebanon Israel border, how the U.S. is approaching it, the internal state of Lebanon, and the best policy to bring about calm on the borders without compromising Lebanon's sovereignty. But let me first briefly introduce our panelists. Ambassador Hale has held, Ambassador David Hale has held a number of senior government positions, including Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Israel, Egypt, and the Levant, Director for Israel Palestinian Affairs and ambassador to Pakistan, Jordan, and Lebanon, as well as special envoy for Middle East peace. Fadi Nicola Nassar is U.S. Lebanon Fellow at the Middle East Institute and director of the Institute for Social Justice and Conflict Resolution and assistant professor of political science and international affairs at the Lebanese American Univers University, LAU. Patricia Karam joins us today in her capacity as senior advisor to the American Task Force for Lebanon, non-resident fellow at both MEI and Arab Center, Washington, DC. And before we begin, let me mention that we've allocated around 20 minutes for your questions after a round of panelist Q&A. Please submit your questions through the Zoom, through the Q&A button there, under if you can see it. Ambassador Hale, let me turn to you first. I will start by addressing the short term this uh, policy paper seeks, and it is avoiding uh, a war between Israel and Hezbollah. We are danger dangerously close to a war, closer than the months before. What's, as, what's at stake here for the US and how is it managing the conflict? Oh, well, thank you, Hibba. Uh, I think in short, what's at stake for the United States and our friends and allies is the uh, imperative to restore deterrence against Iran and its proxies. Um, we've seen this cycle of violence before, um, and if we don't put a stop to the ability of Hezbollah to make the decisions, as Ed said, of life and death for Lebanese and Israelis, we'll continue to see these cycles of escalation in the future. So I think the debate right now really is in Israel about what they're going to do in order to stop living in the shadow of violence uh, posed from their, across their northern border. There's a lot of speculation that when the Gaza conflict winds down, that somehow the uh, risks in Lebanon and Israel somehow are reduced. 
Secretary of State Blinken said as much the other day. Um, I wish that were the case, but I don't think it's so simple. And I think, in fact, it's not in Israel's interest to launch uh, a second front right now beyond what they're already dealing with. Uh, but once the Gaza situation is a little more settled, I think that the issue will be front and center in the Israeli leadership and, and in, the, uh, in the public on what to do about the predicament in North Lebanon. You asked me what the United States is doing about it. Um, I think we're sort of going about it in a classical diplomacy mode, much like we did in the past, including 2006, of trying to cobble together a short-term agreement um, uh, that restores some semblance of stability, but doesn't really change the calculation of power and the balance of power. And to me, that is the essential thing. The address, the strategic foe, and the address for our efforts is in Tehran. It's not in the southern suburbs of Lebanon. And we need a variety of tools, uh, including uh, pressure, in order to make sure that the Iranians understand that not just their Arab proxies will pay the price for this violence, but Iranians as well. Uh, and that may begin to change their calculation and lead them to influence Hezbollah's decision making. But I don't see us yet at that stage. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ambassador. I will move to you, Nicola. Amos Hochstein was dispatched several times to Lebanon to try to bring a diplomatic agreement. How do you evaluate these efforts and how can a broader conflict be prevented without compromising Lebanon's sovereignty? Thank you, Hiba. It's a tough question and it's an important question. Uh, the ongoing conflict has had a devastating impact and the specter of a full-scale war is at its highest since the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. Over 150,000 residents from South Lebanon and North Israel have been displaced. While both belligerents still appear willing to avert a full-scale war, the threat looms large. There is still time and space for diplomacy to succeed, but again, the risk of a larger war breaking out is very serious. Now, to answer the heart of your question and to be fair, we can only really assess what has been made public of the Hochstein Initiative understanding this is a dynamic and sensitive mediation process. Now, in the short and medium term, the Hochstein Initiative proposes withdrawing Hezbollah fighters some eight to 10 kilometers from the border, followed by an increased presence of the Lebanese army and UNIFIL south of the Lithani River. This step is aimed to encourage the return of those displaced residents I mentioned earlier, alongside the demarcation of the border and financial support for South Lebanon and the Lebanese army. Now this policy paper, you know, that I wanna reemphasize signed by 20 leading experts on US policy to Lebanon, and I do encourage our audience to read it, supports this incremental step, recognizing that establishing a buffer zone would be a pragmatic, short-term step towards de-escalation that reinforces UN Security Council Resolution 1701, even if it's not an end in of itself. To be clear, only Lebanese government control over the entire country's territory will achieve lasting stability and border security. Now to complement Washington's diplomatic efforts, the paper directly tackles two key challenges that could affect the sustainability of any negotiated settlement. First, against the backdrop of an escalating conflict, how do you stop any of these different stakeholders from initiating a major full-scale war? Now, the US's role, our paper argues, is quite clear, clear here. It requires a delicate balance of, on the one hand, pressing Israel to remain committed to a diplomatic process by combining vocal opposition with warnings of withholding military aid if it preemptively strikes Lebanon, while at the same time providing it with credible security guarantees should Hezbollah initiate war. And to echo some of the earlier comments shared by Ambassador Hale, it also makes clear the urgency of warning Tehran that if Hezbollah provokes all out war with Israel, it will be met with a strong US response. Now central to the strategy is the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701 and the demarcation of the Lebanon-Israel border. Now the second challenge, and this is, cannot under, underestimate just how significant it is, how do you ensure actors in Lebanon are committed to any diplomatic agreement and the implementation of 1701? Now to take our, our listeners a step back, 
The US played a leading role in facilitating UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which ended the 2006 conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. However, the resolution's main goals, restricting armed presence south of the Luthani River to UNIFIL and the Lebanese army, and disarming all militias in Lebanon were not fully realized and did not receive sufficient attention and follow through after the guns went silent. Today, one significant distinction between the negotiation of 1701 and these current negotiations is the level and nature of involvement from the Lebanese government. In 2006, the Le Lebanese government played a key role in conceiving UNSCR 1701, making it acceptable to the Lebanese people. In contrast, today's caretaker government cannot enforce, let alone call for a ceasefire, with Hezbollah making unilateral decisions to go to war. The Lebanese government must be committed to upholding a negotiated settlement and ensure Hezbollah respects agreed upon withdrawals. That's why this paper makes clear the imperative of having a government committed to stability, reform, and the credibility of its institutions and international responsibilities like upholding 1701 and any commitments in the negotiated settlement. Lastly, and I'm gonna close here, we must acknowledge that Lebanon is currently in a state of crisis. The US has a leading role to play in ensuring that its generous support and training for the Lebanese army effectively enables the deployment of up to 15,000 troops south of the Lithani. US leadership is critical for achieving success in any outcome. This includes backing a government committed to upholding its responsibilities in a negotiated settlement and to its people, establishing a strong buffer zone patrolled solely by the Lebanese army and UNIFIL, and supporting a diplomatic process aimed at fostering lasting stability. The enduring lesson from 2006 to today is straightforward. Continuous follow through and bipartisan support are necessary for achieving success. Thank you, Hiba. Thanks, Nick. We'll get back to that, especially on the, uh, the role that the Lebanese government can do, but also because Hezbollah is the only party negotiating here. So what the, how we can achieve something without compromising Lebanon's sovereignty? I will come back with a common question to all of you, but let me uh, move to Patricia. Patricia, Lebanon is grappling with numerous challenges, including political paralysis for over a year and a half, more than that even. As Ambassador Ed Gabriel mentioned in his opening remarks, but what can the US and France obviously do to help end the, this paralysis? Thanks Hiba, uh, um, and thank you for your question. And uh, clearly um, um, uh, in opening remarks, you know, people did mention that, uh, you know, we have, uh, here we're facing uh, the potential for war without a fully functioning uh, government. So uh, one of the important challenges that is faced by Lebanon is the presidential vacuum. And uh, that's one of the aspects uh, that the uh, that the briefs uh, tackles. For over a year, as, as, as you know, Lebanon has uh, really navigated uh, its multiple crises under the authority of really a caretaker government without a president. And uh, no fewer than 12 parliamentary sessions, I believe, have been organized to find a new candidate to no avail. Uh, so we have here an executive branch, uh, which is at a standstill um, at a time really when the country is facing uh, an exist or existential crisis, uh, I should say. So the last time this happened, it took about two and a half years to really elect uh, a new president. As a result of the vacuum today, the country has really been uh, completely unable to even focus on its internal challenges, uh, including its disastrous economic uh, situation. Now, as the brief argues, it's true that though the Lebanese uh, government uh, or Lebanese political leaders are responsible uh, for electing and shaping a government, uh, the US and France and Friends of Lebanon can really play a constructive role in safeguarding uh, their ability to do so uh, free from coercion so they can the us can really play as the as is covered by the the brief uh, an important role in not really presenting or advocating a candidate but really 
facilitating a consensus process among different parties on a candidate that is ideally reform-minded and appeals to a wide cross-section of, of the Lebanese people. And this is uh, one of our one of the the brief's key recommendation is that the U.S. should really unequivocally support the election of a competent, reform-minded president and the formation of a and I'm quoting here a capable technocratic government in Lebanon without obviously uh, sacrificing these in in border uh, negotiations. So the reality, of course, is that uh, Hezbollah and its allies have been obstructing the election of this president, and they've been trying to impose their own uh, candidates. Uh, but, uh, you know, on, given the track record of governments under the uh, under the influence or beholden to Hezbollah, uh, it, it, it is the opinion of the of the of the collection of uh, signatories that uh, really only a president who is reform minded would be able to to push forward the necessary measures to really uh, shore up uh, the country, the economy, and, and really act uh, in a constructive manner uh, to uh, in trying to stabilize uh, uh, the Israel border. So maybe this is also leading up to uh, Nick's uh, next question as well. So the, 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 this, the presidential file and the, and the paper really underscores it, should really not be subject to any negotiations uh, uh, as, as a, in an attempt to resolve the Hezbollah-Israel sort of conflict. Uh, and the, the paper's recommendation in this regard is that um, the US leadership needs to, again, prioritize the engagement of the quint, the quintet in facilitating uh, electing a president and for this, unity of the international community is needed, as well as, as I mentioned, a facilitated process that really helps produce a sort of compromise candidate. Uh, and of course, the Lebanese government should uh, urgently convene to elect the president. I'll stop here. Thanks, Patricia. I'll go back to you, Nicola. Uh, wh what's the internal state of internal support for or decent towards Hezbollah potential war with Israel? Can you tell us a bit, a little bit more about the mood within uh, Lebanon in this regard? Thank you. I think someone on your end has dismantled my video. Um, but let me jump to your question. The vast majority of Lebanese do not aspire for war. They aspire for stability, security, and a prosperous country. I think my video just popped on. Lebanon is on the brink of war and on the edge of collapsing into a failed state. Over the past five years, the country has weathered unprecedented crises, a severe economic collapse, a monumental political uprising, a global pandemic, and a devastating explosion at the port of Beirut. The ch these challenges have transformed a once vibrant nation into one gripped by despair with many living in dire poverty and lacking basic essentials like electricity and clean water. Amidst this turmoil, as we just heard, Lebanon has been governed by a caretaker administration lacking essential leadership roles, such as a president or a central bank governor. We have seen the forced obstruction towards accountability for the Port of Beirut blast and no meaningful reforms to stabilize the country's debilitating economic crisis. The nexus between Hezbollah and the country's corrupt elite have cost the state its legitimacy and undermined its international and regional credibility. This credibility gap is even more pronounced with the government's glaring absence as Hezbollah and Israel inch closer to war. In the event of a full-scale conflict, it's unclear how any such government that is so lacking in legitimacy can be trusted to oversee any reconstruction or recovery. At the same time, mass atrocities in Gaza and increased Israeli incursion in Lebanon and bellicose statements have bolstered Iran and its proxies, exploiting local grievances to portray themselves as the sole defenders against unchecked Israeli aggression. The US must recognize this dynamic and move away from a model of conflict management to conflict resolution. Again, to the heart of your question, the majority of Lebanese people aspire to a democratic future and wish to disengage from regional conflicts. Supporting Lebanon does not necessitate extensive military commitments, but does require a strategic, 
sustained approach. The question on ordinary minds in Lebanon is who speaks for the Lebanese at the negotiating table. This policy paper, to its best ability, does strive to present a voice on behalf of those seeking reform and stability in Lebanon. Thank you, Hibbal. Thanks, Fadi. I'll, I'll go back to Ambassador Hale. Ambassador, you mentioned Iran, and you mentioned that the, the problem has to, to be tackled with Iran directly first. I don't know if the US is doing that right now. But in case of a war, what's the likelihood of the axis of resistance between brackets being, act being activated and Iran getting involved? Can you outline a scenario where this happens and what would be the US response? Well, of course, there is a war. I guess the question is whether if it were to escalate into something that's full, full blown. Um, but I'd also say Iran is and its uh, proxies and allies are also uh, pretty fully engaged right now in this conflict as well. And I think it's at a level that is exactly suiting suitable to Iran and uh, precisely what they want. When they did get more directly involved after the back and forth with the Israelis attacked their uh, senior leadership in Damascus, and then there was the retaliation by Iran with missiles and drones against Israel, um, it, it showed that at the state to state level, Iran is at a major disadvantage. They backed down immediately and they backed down not because they wanted the conflict to end. Uh, they backed down because they wanted to rechannel the conflict back to where it was advantageous to them, which is at the level of proxies and the asymmetrical warfare that the proxies are so uh, successful at engaging uh, Israel with. Um, so I think that they will continue that that approach rather than take the risks of trying to get directly involved. If for some reason they were to try again to launch a barrage of missiles and drones against Israel or some other tactics that they may have, including terrorism, by the way, which uh, they could could uh, deploy anywhere in the world, um, then the United States will be faced again with the question of how are we going to restore deterrence? And uh, that may require military response on our part directed toward IRGC or other Iranian military targets uh, around the Arab world. Um, and uh, redoubling our sanctions and interdicting the military supplies that Iran is providing to its allies like Russia and its proxies like Hezbollah. So I think that, frankly, is a restoration of deterrence, which will be the appropriate preemptive response. And this is exactly the debate that the Israelis are going through right now. <clears throat> Thanks, Ambassador. Patricia, I'll go back with you to the uh, Hezbollah question again. What about the sovereignty deficit caused by Hezbollah influence over the state, the society, the economy now? We have the flow of cash in Lebanon. Could you elaborate a little bit on this situation, the impact, and how the U.S. can help curtail it in the current context? Uh, thanks, Hiba. And, uh, you know, uh, the issue of sovereignty or Lebanon sovereignty is one of the biggest challenges, obviously, and it's uh, linked to everything else. And uh, it's tackled quite extensively in the brief. You, you, if we, one effectively has a, a, a weak state that's really captured and exploited by, uh, you know, a kleptocratic political class that has effectively depleted the, vi the economic viability of the country. And this together with foreign interference by Iran, which has compromised its sovereignty. This is the situation that we're dealing with. Today, despite everything that has transpired in Lebanon, you have the same political class or the same political leaders that also continue to hinder um, you some, of, some of the basic sort of reforms that are uh, necessary to break the stalemate, the stalemate, the political stalemate, and facilitate in particular uh, international financial support. Um, you, you know, Ed mentioned the World Bank, uh, you know, which which uh, described uh, the, the financial crisis in Lebanon as a deliberate depression that was orchestrated by the elite at the expense of its uh, the country's stability, long-term stability and social peace. So again, the you have a political class which is deeply enmeshed with economic and business elites, among which are prominent sort of bank owners and shareholders who have all mismanaged and exploited state resources, uh, effectively collapsing the economy and plunging uh, its citizens in, into poverty. So the system, what we commonly refer to as the manzume, uh, that has really 
effectively success, su successfully counteracted any and all challenges to its uh, stranglehold and managed to, as Nick mentioned, escape accountability has, has further sort of entrenched itself in the process. Uh, and and ultimately, sort of the disinterest of this, or the in, disinterest, I say, but inability at the same time of the class, the political class to even address the most uh, basic grievances of the population has really normalized also corruption and enhanced at the same time, the tolerance of corruption in the country. So, and here you have Hezbollah as the de facto sort of enforcer of this corrupt political system uh, from which uh, the ruling uh, parties benefit. So here, I mean, one of the important um, recommendations in the brief was that, uh, is that not only should a targeted sanctions uh, regime be applied uh, against these corrupt uh, government spoilers who are obstructing reform and justice in Lebanon, uh, but the government of Lebanon should, uh, uh, in tandem, take sort of serious steps to combat corruption and impunity, um, including uh, several uh, suggested measures, which an anti-corruption strategy, building open data platforms, uh, guaranteeing fundamental freedoms, etc. Now, we know that Hezbollah, uh, backed by Iran, has been, as the paper itself indicates, really successful at gaining support and at the same time while exploiting uh, the fragility of the state uh, to preserve its its sort of autonomy and arms. Uh, but it has also, you mentioned, and you yourself mentioned, it has also benefited from uh, the state and economic collapse and, and the, the, the informal sector, uh, as well as this cash economy, which is unregulated, that has really come out of the collapse and transformed the country as... Uh, into a hub for uh, you know money laundering narco trafficking cr criminality um even at the same time that sort of critical public institutions are falling apart um so so and here again the the paper tackles this by suggesting that any aid that is given to uh, the government and any Lebanese stakeholders really be conditioned on compliance with reforms that really combat criminality, money laundering, and narco trafficking. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, within the framework of going back, the LAF's deployment to the border as part of any sort of agreement that is secured uh, um, um, to create a buffer zone portions of the Syrian-Lebanese border uh, might be secured to also clamp down uh, some of that illegal cross-border activity and criminality. So, so ultimately, stabilizing Lebanon, as the paper itself argues, cannot happen uh, to, to, to echo what Nick said without addressing this sort of symbiosis between Hezbollah and the country's elite and in the process sort of trying to restore the credibility of, of state institutions and the former uh, uh, the formal economy. And here reform accountability uh, continue to be key as well as reform um, uh, reforms that enable any sort of aids or ensure that any any form of international aid that comes to Lebanon either now or or post conflict conflict to the south is efficiently directed. And finally, one I couldn't end or one couldn't end without mentioning that there is already a starting point for jump starting sort of the country's economic recovery in, in an IMF led plan that really uh, aims to restore the, the sustainability uh, of, of Lebanon's uh, economy and finances and to strengthen sort of government's uh, governance and transparency. Uh, but of course, vested interests which I mentioned before, have really stood in the way of uh, implementing or in, in the implementation of these necessary financial banking and governance reforms on which aid is conditioned. And again, the, the, the ATFL MEI paper really uh, believes or its starting point is that economic reforms without which economic recovery is not feasible should really be urgently implemented. And I'll stop. Thank you, Patricia. We can go on and on on that, but we are trying to um, to understand this paper policy and understand where things stand now. But the question is, currently the U.S. is negotiating with Hezbollah. Indirectly, it's negotiating with Hezbollah. 
he, they are the party who are negotiating, not the Lebanese government. And if you would ask them uh, to withdraw from the borders, then you have to pay some price. This is how negotiations work. Correct me, Ambassador Hale, if, it is, if it's not accurate. So the, a common question for you, how we can avoid implementing a short-term solution on the borders, I mean, uh, that could inadvertently strengthen Hezbollah grip, Hezbollah grip internally. I mean, if you will ask them to withdraw, if, you, if the US will ask them to withdraw from the borders, and also it's a big question because we know that the villagers, their supporters live there. It would be at what cost internally? They are the party negotiating here. And I will start with you, Ambassador Hale. Thank you, Hiva. Uh, well, the equation you set up is one way to look at it. Uh, another way to look at it is that if you want to avoid this classical approach, which is what we've been doing since the early 90s, which is uh, conceding things to Hezbollah, in order to buy short-term periods of, of quiet in South Lebanon and Northern Israel. If you want to break that cycle, you have to go back to, and I'm afraid I sound like a, a tape recorder, but go back to the basic problem. It's a balance of power in which Iran and its proxies are able to use the threat or the reality of violence in order to maintain this presence and maintain this threat against Israel. So your strat if your strategy is focused solely on Lebanon, you will never break out of this pattern. We'll be living this forever. And there's no reason to believe, even if these Lebanese uh, Hezbollah were somehow persuaded to say that they were withdrawing from uh, a border zone in South Lebanon, there's no reason to believe that would really eliminate the threat that they pose toward Israel. It's a question of will and motivation, as well as capability. And that, again, rests in Tehran. If we aren't changing the equation with Tehran regionally, if Tehran continues to have the ability to set the agenda whenever it wants, wherever it wants in the Middle East, then this will, this won't stop. So there has to be an adjustment of our attitude toward Iran and a willingness to, uh, to uh, escalate if necessary, but certainly impose, reimpose the sanctions that have basically not been implemented uh, in the last three years and take a much tougher line with the Iranians. And then they might see that the risks to them are such that they want to moderate uh, Hezbollah. And it's at that stage where returning to the elements of 1701 could be very productive because all the elements are there, but they don't work if there isn't a change in motivation. Thank you, Ambassador. To you, Fadi. Thank you, Hiba. Um, it's difficult for me to add to Ambassador Hale, given I think the answer is quite comprehensive. And I would encourage our audiences um, to take a step back and avoid, as I tried to indicate in my second response, adopting a model of conflict management rather than one of resolution. Um, I also don't share the assessment uh, that Hezbollah can ransom uh, the Lebanese people's aspirations for security and stability in return or in exchange for something else, unless I misunderstood the question. But important as, as that is, I do want to take a moment to reflect on the lessons the United States should learn itself from what went wrong after 2006. Um, certainly, the Lebanese government has fallen short on its responsibilities across different administrations in implementing and upholding its responsibilities to 1701. But there are deeper questions for this, for a new United States administration looking at this context to say, what went wrong on our end? Why didn't the follow through come, the follow through uh, needed to see the implementation? Uh, translate in terms of policy. And I think that's very key uh, to avoiding exactly this model of waiting for the guns to go silent and then stopping U.S. policy towards Lebanon at that point. Uh, that, for me, is a key lesson learned from 2006. Thanks, Hiba. Thank you, Fadi. Patricia, briefly, please, because we have to move to the second. 
just question did you ask about uh, strengthening hezbollah or us policy just no, help me hezbollah inside how do how do we how do we um, avoid uh, strengthening hezbollah is your question no, if we want to implement this short term solution on the borders how the, can we do that without again like compromising without strengthening hezbollah grip uh, in, in, internally yeah, that's what I thought you asked. And to be honest with you, um, uh, to diverge a little bit with the other two um, um, panelists, I, I, to be honest, I don't think in the current context we can avoid it. I think, unfortunately, either way, whether one whether it works or whether it doesn't work, Lebanon loses because Lebanon is hostage to Hezbollah. And so uh, an interim solution on the border in my view, if that's what you're asking, risks uh, simply deferring the problem. And in the case of conflict, um, I think Lebanon will become a sort of collateral damage in a in a war, because uh, in a war because of Hezbollah that really bypasses um, bypasses the state on the basis of an ideological co commitment to defeat Israel. Uh, so I think I think it's difficult. Uh, to envisage an alternative uh, scenario whereby Hezbollah agrees as much as it says it doesn't want war and as much as it has to lose from a war in the case that it doesn't agree to enforce 1701 or to reduce its presence or to demarcate the border when its uh, whole raison d'etre uh, as a resistance movement is sort of built on uh, this rhetoric of liberating uh, the occupied land from Israel. So I think it's difficult. Uh, there's no way for, for Hezbollah to avoid the coming fight because doing so would really negate everything its leadership has said and stood for. And unfortunately, of course, the Lebanese will pay uh, the, the price. Thank you, Patricia. I'll move to the q and uh, Some question we already uh, addressed. But uh, I will start with this. What's new about this brief that hasn't already been said in many other reports this year? Fadi. Well, that's a tough question. Uh, but perhaps what I would encourage you know, our audience uh, to take from this discussion um, and to take from the report is several aspects. First, you know, what we heard from Ambassador Gabriel and Dr. Paul Sedem is that it represents consensus among leading experts, among notable signatories, that there is an urgent need for a robust diplomatic solution to the conflict and the development and establishment of a short, medium, and long-term US policy towards Lebanon. That for me stands out, but I do want to give the opportunity uh, to hear from our other panelists. Yes, Ambassador Haid. Thank you. Yeah, I think Nick uh, Fadi's right. And um, I would also add that I think uh, it's clear in the report that there's a, an appeal for persistence in the American approach. Uh, the history of American involvement in Lebanon is unfortunately a history of oscillation where we get heavily involved at a moment of crisis, like the current state of affairs, uh, paper together some, some outcome, uh, things get difficult, and then we, we basically walk away. And it's during those periods of neglect in which our foes, like Hezbollah, are able to gather strength. So I think it's very important that we are persistent in our approach. We're also realistic, uh, and I, I think Patricia's right that there is a high price that the Lebanese are paying now and are likely to continue to pay. But I also think this report has brought into focus the Iranian dimension. Uh, and uh, the various signatories may disagree on the details, but I think we're all in agreement with what was written there, which is that Iran is a central and key element. And that if we don't have a rational strategy to deal with that problem, everything else we do is going to fall short. Patricia, do you have anything to add here? Yes, I want to say a couple of things. One is urgency. Uh, you know, the effect of war, which is very imminent and very likely, is is going to be catastrophic. So there's that that the report underscores. Two, there's the fact that what's happening right now, is, what's happening in terms of U.S. policy, in terms of approach to Lebanon, isn't working. And something has to change. And that's something that the report underscores. Um, 
And the fact, thirdly, the fact that the signatories are also represent uh, sort of experts from across the, the, the aisle, and that if anything has to change, it needs to be sort of a bipartisan. Uh, and it needs to be bipartisan. If U.S. policy has to change towards Lebanon, it needs to be bipartisan. And uh, it needs to, uh, the, at least the report argues that uh, U.S.-Lebanon policy needs to be tied to U.S.-Iran policy because uh, Hezbollah is also uh, a central, has a central role in the so-called uh, axis of resistance. And so I think all of those things make the 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 paper uh, quite uh, timely and important. We have, uh, thank you, Patricia. We have this question from George Bailey. Uh, he said, this is my specific question with I, which I have not been able to get an answer to from Washington. Is what guarantees Israel is seeking to ensure that resolution 1701 is genuinely implemented, including the withdrawal of Hezbollah from the borders 18 years after the passage of the resolution. Ambassador Hill, to you. Well, the Israelis are asking themselves the same question, and this is the, this is the predicament, because uh, 1701 had all the elements necessary to stabilize the situation, and, and uh, in some ways it did by periods of calm, but uh, at any moment, Hezbollah could change the equation as it did uh, on October 8 for reasons that had nothing to do with South Lebanon. And this is something that the Israelis are unlikely to be persuaded to go back to. Even if all of the elements of 1701 were fully implemented, what guarantee, as you asked the question, what guarantees that Hezbollah won't, uh, won't launch an assault anyway? UNIFIL is there. What will more UNIFIL soldiers do? The LAF is there. What will more LAF soldiers do? Um, there is a buffer zone. It happens to be on the Israeli side of the border right now, not the Lebanese side. It hasn't stopped the conflict or the threat of an escalation. So I go back to the point is that the balance of power has to change. And then a Security Council resolution, whether it's 1701 or a new one, can help implement what the new balance of power has accomplished. And that, unfortunately, is what's leading the Israelis to believe that there is no political or diplomatic guarantee. There has to be a military approach to this problem. Now, we all know, based on what happened in 2006, that uh, that, that approach only takes them so far. And a ground offensive would be highly, highly risky. Um, and could make things much worse. And also the level of armament on both sides is in levels of sophistication and in firepower far exceeds what we experienced in 2006. So the risks are really great, but the Israelis go back to the predicament. What is going to prevent us from living once again in the shadow of the constant threat of Hezbollah attacking them? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Fadi, I have this question. Uh, you spoke a little bit about that. Some might argue that Hezbollah thrives in an environment of corruption and cannot survive in a reformed one. This doesn't change the fact that corruption already exists. The question remains, how should priorities be set? Which should come first, disarming Hezbollah or addressing the economic situation? Thank you. Again, a very interesting question, and that's one way to look at it in terms of sequencing. Uh, but I think it's very important when we take some step back, you know, Lebanon saw a very notable process in 2019, an uprising that stood against the mafia militia nexus, a term that is commonly used in Lebanon. And it stood against that kleptocratic political class that embodies the corruption you're referencing and that the report references, as well as the security dominion of Hezbollah and its coercive tactics. My worry with framing these as separate um, is that you cannot address either one without disentangling that relationship. Um, and, and again, the experience from 2019 demonstrates that when we saw an uprising, uh, when we saw efforts, for example, for accountability led by Judge Bitar for accountability in the Port of Beirut last, they were obstructed. Obstructed and coercion is very key. Uh, so again, you have to combine both together. You cannot separate them together. That's my response. Okay, Patricia, this is for you. And uh, let Patricia. me make it clear. Hey, yeah. can I just 
Yeah, go ahead. Can I sorry, respond. Apologies for the distraction. Uh, kids have no sense of when you're actually live and not live. But I do, I do want to just respond quickly to the question, if you'll allow me, because um, I think there, the, the, unfortunately, this is a very difficult question. But the entanglement of the two issues uh, creates, oftentimes, you know. Uh, leads to further paralysis has or has at least lead, led to further while well, I'm of the conviction that you know the question of Lebanon sovereignty and tackling you know the 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 militia part of the ma mafia militia nexus is is critical I think the steps that will lead towards that are different than the urgent problem that the country is facing, which is one of economic, complete economic uh, collapse. It's a state of fight, I mean, that really needs to be tackling. So unfortunately, the risk of when they are totally uh, embroiled together and conditioned on each other leads to no movement on either one of them. And so um, I, I just, you know, I, I would just I would take a little bit of issue with with sort of uh, the the response that just entangles them. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's okay. It just I want uh, I have I want I have to mention that we are receiving many questions from anonymous attendees. So, uh, so if I'm not mentioning the name, that's because I don't know the name. But here's a, another question. As we speak, Lebanon faces a severe crisis with potential widespread power outages due to the EDL's inability to purchase diesel. The central, bank, the central bank's acting governor has refused to lend money to the government, a policy implemented since his appointment. It is the question, in this paper, you are urging the parliament to pass necessary reforms to secure an IMF deal. Yet, Lebanon's issues are deeply structural that the IMF prerequisite conditions are not tackling. Why push for IMF deal when the fundamental governance structures remain corrupt and dysfunctional? The alternative Patricia. to an I Yes, is, is the, the question is to me. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. the IMF deal is the only thing that there is on the table right now. And as I mentioned before, there are vested interests that represent both government and government actors, banks, and who have everything to lose from the IMF uh, deal being implemented, which includes a number of uh, re reforms that restructure the banks, governance, transparency, etc., which uh, have been stalled uh, since for, for at least three, four years now. So uh, without the IMF deal, uh, uh, the, the, the proponents, the, the, the people who are proposing that the IMF deal be left, be discarded, are those who uh, are calling for a collapse. And a collapse of uh, the, the a full collapse of the state is not something that is desirable or feasible and its repercussions on the population, the country uh, will be tremendous. And therefore the IMF is a good starting point for, uh, for logical, uh, 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 feasible sort of uh, reforms that will help the country recover. And uh, I, I do think that uh, problematizing the IMF, as many have been doing, is, uh, is something that will lead us down a road that uh, we don't want to go on. Ambassador Hale, this question for you. How might hiccups in the proposed phased approach to resolving the Israel-Gaza conflict impact Lebanon negotiations? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How might hiccups in the proposed phase approach to resolving Israel-Gaza conflict impact right. Lebanon negotiations? Thank you, yeah. Um, well, as I said at the beginning, I, my own view, and I, I hope I'm proven wrong, but my own view is that uh, you see an escalation in violence between Lebanon and Israel whenever there is the sign of some kind of possible breakthrough between uh, in the situation in Gaza. And to me, that's because both sides recognize that that's gonna be a moment of truth. Once the Gaza situation is somehow uh, under control, if that's the right phrase to use, 
uh, that then we won't know what Israel intends to do. I think that the Israeli public itself is divided on these questions, and as is the Israeli leadership, as to whether an aggressive approach or a diplomatic approach would be appropriate. So I think that it's when uh, the phases begin to be implemented, if they are in Gaza, that you're going to see more tension in the north rather than less in South Lebanon. Thank you, Ambassador. We have three minutes left. And Fadi, I will ask you this question um, also from anonymous attendee, attendee. No one can deny that Lebanon wasn't a priority before October 7th. Some might say it wasn't even on the table and that the Americans were fine with the study. How can we make the case that investing in Lebanon is relevant, is relevant to U.S. national security? Thank you. It's a powerful question, and I'm grateful to close with it. When we consider U.S. policy towards Lebanon, we must first make the case for why Lebanon matters and clarify what the United States can offer to foster a lasting partnership between our nations and peoples. Lebanon's greatest strength lies, in my opinion, paradoxically, in what might appear as vulnerabilities. Its pluralism, openness, the unwavering spirit of its people striving for economic and political freedom. For years, and I want to push back on, on something noted earlier, Lebanese citizens transcended sectarian and geographic divides. They bravely protested against a broken political system. When these protests initially fell short of achieving transformative change, they regrouped to establish alternative political parties and competed in elections, marking a historic shift that weakened Hezbollah's grip on parliament. And it is the only reason that Hezbollah cannot impose their presidential candidate today. Also, the local investigation into the devastating Beirut blast led courageously by Judge Bitad serves as a rare but crucial reminder of Lebanon's internal struggle to reclaim state integrity and uphold state institutions. Yet the obstruction of the investigation, coupled with the failure to fulfill demands for this technocratic government, highlight the challenges posed by Hezbollah's coercion. What can ordinary people do in the face of unchecked political violence? Now, while Lebanon's future remains uncertain, it's not hopeless. These actors that I mentioned face an uphill battle against an illiberal adversary sustained by corruption, violence, and impunity. They shouldn't face that alone. Now, echoing Ambassador Hale's comments, and I'll tie it up and close with this, there are two starkly contrasting paths for Lebanon. It can emerge as an example of a durable, functioning democracy countering Iran's failed authoritarian vision for the region, or it could tragically symbolize state collapse, systemic corruption, and militia dominance. The international community led by the US and its allies must seize this moment to bolster Lebanon's reform and democratic forces and uphold the aspirations of its people. This entails not only stabilizing this current conflict, but challenging the grip of Hezbollah and a corrupt political elite that have failed the Lebanese. These are not just efforts about Lebanon. They're about advancing regional stability and demonstrating US commitment to promoting democratic values and containing spoilers globally. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. Thank you, Ambassador Hale. Thank you, Patricia, for all your insights and time. And thanks for the audience. Unfortunately, we couldn't get more questions. We have to stick to the time we, that we have. And thank you, ATFL and MEI, for hosting this timely and insightful conversation today. Thank you.